so we can start now i can start yes sir okay uh, so welcome everybody to the second lecture in this series of lectures on mechanobiology uh, just a quick recap of what we saw the last uh, in the last lecture we, i introduced you to all the molecules all the proteins to be precise uh, which are involved in the mechanotransduction of an external force from the extracellular matrix or anywhere outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And in this lecture, we would see what are the techniques uh, which are used, what are the experiments we use to address the specific questions related to such force transduction. So, if you see this one, this is a cartoon. If you carefully look at this one, you will see that the, there is a mention of as a matrix, and this matrix can be of various types, stiff matrix, soft matrix, uh, then of various topography, and then the cell on top of that, okay? So, this, gives you a rough idea of what are the external forces that can be communicated to the cell and how the cell responds to those changes. Suppose the matrix is stiff, the cell spreads more, the matrix is soft, the cell rounds up, or if there is a change in the topography of the matrix, you can manipulate the topography of the matrix synthetically made by various methods I'll discuss subsequently. And if you put cells on top of that, then the matrix exerts differential force on the cell. The cell in response, it triggers the upregulation or the downregulation of certain transcription factors, which in a feedback loop add, enables the cell to adjust to that environment. And how we measure such cell deformation, it also gives you an idea. We can flow the cell through the microfluidic channels. We can make a mesh. Uh, let me, let me point it out. So we can make a mesh of this three-dimensional uh, structure and you can embed the cells there. We do the metrigel assays for the cancer cells and see the migration of the cancer cells, which gives us an idea about the uh, metastasis or the nature of metastasis of the cells. And we can, of course, use techniques like AFM and we can stretch the membrane by which we can stretch the cells. We can use the micropipette aspiration and various other methods are there. So this is basically a summary slide of the techniques, what we are going to discuss in the subsequent uh, next uh, 45 to minutes to one hour. Okay. So this is again a kind of a busy slide. I don't want you to go through each of it, of the lines, through the lines. But this is a, this is a fantastic review. I actually uh, took this from this review by Jan May and Wright, Reithard King in Physiology Review. Uh, and it gives you the, the terms. It, it, it actually familiarizes you with the terms like, what is elasticity? What is viscoelasticity? What is viscosity, stress, strain, so on, so forth, okay? So after you get back from this lecture, you can you can pause this video and take this down, or you can go to this uh, the website of the paper, download the paper if you're interested, and this gives you a fairly good idea of what mechanobiology is, what are the different stresses which are which are used to shear the cells, and uh, what are the strain response from the cells, how do we calculate that, so on and so forth. So 
let's begin with the term elasticity. We, we use the term very loosely every day in our everyday life. Uh, we say a plastic bottle. We say an elastic rubber band, right? So just other than saying it colloquially, what is the meaning of the term elasticity or what's the meaning of the term plasticity in, the, in terms of physics? So elasticity is defined as unique ability of solid to resist the deforming forces and to return to its original shape when the force is withdrawn. Okay. <clears throat> Whereas plasticity is the phenomenon when the object fails to do so and remains in the permanently deformed state. That's that's exactly the the definition of this uh, of this. Uh, Plasticity and elasticity, and it is given by Young's modulus. It's actually stressed by strain, is and expressed in the uh, unit of Pascal in the SI unit, which is actually Newton per meter square. And below you see a picture from Shutterstock. It's you know just if you try to pull a rubber band, uh, you will see that it keeps on elongating uh, until a point comes where it actually snaps. All right. So that's the that's the elastic limit of the band. So all this by when I, I, I would explain the term when I would refer to the term elasticity, it would always convey this sense to you that when a cell is elastic, it, you should picture in your mind that the cell can be stretched in the directions. Okay. So in terms of the cell, in terms of the cell biology, when we say plasticity, plasticity means more of a fluid-like character. Elasticity would mean more of a solid-like character. Okay, so you would you would possibly appreciate the fact if I if I say that in a, in a in, in a germline cell, you will you will see that uh, in actually a stem cell, in some kind of stem cell, you will see that the chromosomes are very plastic. Okay. So by this, I mean that the chromosomes are very soft. They have not yet attained the territorial organization, which they do when they fully differentiate into a specific lineage. All right. So when they differentiate into a specific lineage and the chromosomes are organized into specific territories, elastic as opposed to plastic. Okay. So the fluidity of the chromosome is lost when it differentiates. It kind of locks the chromosome in a particular territorial shape and confines it inside the cell at a particular location. Of course, it does not mean that they will remain there forever. Any change in the environment of the cell or in the biology of the cell can change a little bit the organization of the heterochromatin and, and the euchromatin, but basically the chromosome no longer they remains plastic. So I think you now understand that plasticity would often mean, uh, uh, would be used to mean <clears throat> more fluidity, more soft uh, uh, behavior, and elasticity would be a more stiffer behavior. Okay, so if you see this, uh, the viscosity of the fluid is the resistance of the uh, between the between the layers, adjacent layers of the fluid when they are in motion, and this leads to the term viscosity. Okay, so uh, in a, in the Newtonian fluid, viscosity actually is a mistake. I'm sorry about that. It it should be eta, not mu. Please correct it. It should be eta. Okay, this is just wrongly written here. Uh, it's a mistake. Eta is independent of the rate of change of strain. But in the non-Newtonian fluids, they exhibit a wide range of the correlations between shear stress and strain. So uh, you, can, you, can, you can see this little, little um, you know, a GIF image and, uh, uh, from Wikipedia, which, which, actually, which actually tells you how, uh, how a normal fluid flows and how a, how a viscous fluid Right. All right. So 
viscoelasticity of the property of the substance which has both the elastic and viscous behavior while undergoing the, the, the deformation. And viscoelastic materials have some sort of uh, dependence of strain on the time. So if you look at the curve, uh, it's stress by strain. Typically, we represent stress by sigma and strain, that is the change in length divided by length, and stress is nothing but force. So uh, this stress by strain is usually a straight line, which means that if you remove the deforming forces, the system comes back absolutely to its original component. But if in the case of the viscoelastic uh, substances, you will see that the stress-strain curve has a hysteresis loop, right? Which means the deformation on application of force and upon withdrawal of force, when the system goes back from deformation, those two parts have different routes. And some part of the energy during this process is lost as heat in a loading and unloading cycle. So this is the basic difference, uh, basic physics of the viscoelastic substance as compared to an elastic substance. <clears throat> Now, what are the viscoelastic components of the, uh, of, of the tissue? The extracellular matrix and the cytoskeletal nucleoskeletal system embedded in that constitute the viscoelasticity in the tissues. So what do we mean by that? So when a, you, 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 you imagine a cell that is the cytoplasm, it contains these cytoskeletons. But where are the cytoskeletons? The cytoskeleton is in a thick soup, which is the cytosol, cytoplasm. So these filamentous systems being present in a, in a, in a fluid-like environment, these actually leads to the viscoelasticity of the tissues, likewise. In the case of the extracellular matrix, the bunch of proteins which makes up the uh, the basement membrane, which we have, which we have seen in the in the last lecture, are non-crystalline, and they are in some aqueous medium, thus qualifying them for viscoelastic components, as they exhibit some time-dependent strain. Now, what is the time, the term, the time dependent strain means? Which means that when you apply of deforming force, the change in length of the substance is continuing over a period of time, supposed to a spring. So if you hang a load to a spring, the spring immediately elongates, right? Reaches its maximum elongated length. But when you apply the strain, to a, when, when we apply a stress to a viscoelastic substance, it, you know, it gradually, gradually extends over time. And this exhibits the time dependent strain relationship of the viscoelastic material. Okay. Just a second. So they exhibit the time-dependent uh, strain, and uh, when uh, we go to the next slide, uh, there are the two models which actually explain the uh, the uh, viscoelastic behavior of the cell. Uh, the first model was was proposed by James Clerk Maxwell, uh, who was a who was truly a polymath of the of 19th century, and he has his contributions in various fields of physics. So he told that the viscoelastic model can be understood by the series combination of a Newtonian dash part. I'll explain what a dash part is, and a Hookean spring, so purely elastic spring. Okay. And this is given by the relation sigma plus eta plus e is the elastic modeling and eta is the viscosity 
uh, well within bracket uh, sigma dot that is 30 sigma dt and uh, that's equal to eta times e which is the strain so under a constant stress the strain has two components an elastic and a viscous component elastic component is highlighted by the spring and the viscous component is highlighted by a dashboard so imagine the viscous component to be the cytoplasm okay and the actin or the microtubule or the intermediate filament to be the spring so the way the force is propagated from the extracellular matrix to the interior of, to the interior of the cell up to the nucleus is via the behavior of the newtonian dashboard and the hookian spring which means that part of the force would be dissipated as heat in you know in in, in the in the cytoplasm it's the viscous component and the remaining is transmitted through the spring the elastic component corresponding to the spring occurs instantaneously as i mentioned that there is no time lag and also relaxes immediately upon the release of strain whereas the viscous component it grows as long as there is uh, the stress applied over a period of time. So the Maxwell model predicts, this is the most important thing, that stress decays exponentially with time. One limitation of this model is that it does not predict the constant stress or the creep accurately. What does constant stress mean? That is, you, you keep on applying the stress at a particular at a particular uh, magnitude okay you don't vary the stress that's a constant stress now coming back to the newtonian dashboard imagine you have a syringe okay but i mean the just a hypodermic syringe you use to inject uh, uh you know, the, the drugs in, in in your body or in some medication in your body and that is connected to a spring and to that spring a load is attached so when you pull the load the spring is immediately elongated but you will observe you can you can really do this little fun experiment at home and you will see that the dashboard which is filled with the fluid if you fill it with a fluid a viscous fluid the 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 plunger actually comes out slowly okay so this means that the stress is constantly being transferred to that dashboard which is showing the constants uh, which is showing a dependence of strain with the time as the time goes the, grows the strain also is building all right well every model has a limitation and there is a way of betterment of every model and <coughs> excuse me it was later proposed by kelvin and 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 void lord kelvin and void that uh this should be considered in parallel, not in series. Okay, so this is just a this is just a minor, uh, you know, uh, the change in the arrangement in that circuit of the dashboard and the Hookean spring. If you call it a circuit, strictly not a circuit, but if you just call it loosely, and you will see that uh, the the expression also also changes. So when the strain is removed, the material gradually relaxes to the non-deformed state. At a constant stress, that's what is given by creep. Later on, we would express it as a function j. It's a function of time. We, we, we would come to the term creep compliance later on. Uh, the model can do well, but similar to Maxwell model, the Kelvin void model also has a limitation. And this model is much less accurate in explaining the relaxation. Note the, uh, the little remark which is given at the bottom. There is an excellent paper in PRL published in August 2020, which shows uh, for the mathematical modeling of the, you know, uh, the epithelial and molonaire uh, cell that the uh, the model of this uh, the, the flow is like a Maxwell viscoelastic degree and not a, a Kelvin void model. So this is clearly the this is clearly the thing now. So the Kelvin void model is uh, was used as a replacement for uh, many many different aspects, 
which was not explained in the Maxwell model. And now we see that the Kelvin Voigt model is also not complete. Okay. So what exactly happens in the cell is actually a very complicated system. You can model it mathematically, is a is a combination of the Kelvin Voigt and the Maxwell at times and places. All right. So uh, when we apply the storage, uh, when when we apply uh, a force to the, uh, the biopolymers, we actually apply a small oscillatory force uh, and an oscillatory stress, which results in the strain. And there can be uh, the three different situations. So <clears throat> viscoelastic biopolymers can be studied by different methods. Uh, first, we are going to describe the method of rheology. The word, the word rheology comes from the Greek rio, which means stream, which means there is a relationship with flow. So the biopolymers, especially, you know, actin and intermediate filaments, they have been studied. Uh, the actin has been studied for quite long. The intermediate filaments, not uh, as extensively as actin, but there are some studies in the recent times which have been done using the uh, rheological measurements. So the instrument by which we measure is called a rheometer, and the study of this shearing, these viscoelastic biopolymers by, oscillatory, uh, by applying an oscillatory stress is called, vis, uh, is called rheology. So there can be the three conditions, that is the purely elastic uh, materials have stress and strain in phase, so there is no phase difference. In viscous material, the phase uh, lags by 90 degree, and in a viscoelastic material, it's in between, right? So we introduce the term here, uh, that is the dynamic modulus G, some also refer it as the G star, uh, is used to represent the relationship between oscillatory stress and strain. And G star, as you know, uh, is the, the, the storage modulus, and it is the cost component, and the G, uh, the, uh, the G double prime, I mean, the G prime is the storage modulus, G double prime is the loss modulus. So this is the imaginary component, or this is the sign component, where the sigma and epsilon zero are the amplitudes of stress and strain, and delta is, of course, the phase shift. As you already know that I is uh, root of uh, minus one, because it's imaginary, this is imaginary root, and this is, this, forms the basis of the real measurements. Okay, so this is how a rheometer looks like. Uh, you can find a rheometer in various places. <clears throat> you can find a rheometer in um, the, the mechanobiology labs studying all these the biopolymers. Okay, you can find the rheometer in, um, in uh, the, uh, the paint industry where they actually study the viscosity of the paint you can you can find this commuter in uh, in factories which synthesize the nail polish you know anything anything any viscous fluid which has some sort of viscosity that is measured by the other so there are various models of the rheometer this is from anton park they are the pioneers in this uh, the uh, rheometry and making the the rheometers and it comes in various flavors so if you see at the top, there is something uh, which, is, which looks like a cone or a, uh, uh, you know, so this cone actually is made to come down and you put your sample right on the plate. Okay? So this plate is here, the blue one on top of this platform on which you see the red one, okay, which is coming out between the cone and the plate. This is the fluid which you are going to measure. And then you bring this, uh, Cone in contact with the fluid, and then we apply an oscillatory stress. So when you do that, so of course when it moves, there are components of omega, that's angular velocity. There will be component of alpha, it's a cone of the plate. What is the angle of the solid angle of the cone that it <clears throat> makes with the sample? And uh, uh, the plate geometries all all can vary depending on the uh, need on what you are using that for. So you can actually pretty much customize your uh, your plate and the, and your cone, and as a result of that, you can uh, you can you can study 
the viscoelasticity in various modes. Let me just check whether there is any uh, chat. No, there is no, there's no message. Okay. So here, here is one example of a uh, Okay, so here is, is one example of uh, the, uh, the viscoelastic measurement in the case of a biopolymer. So <clears throat> the idea is, so these experiments are very simple. It needs a fundamental understanding of the physics of the viscosity of the elasticity. And if you are familiar with that, uh, you can simply think of any experiment you want to design uh, based on the elastic or the viscoelastic behavior to be more precise of the, the biopolymer and what you want to investigate. So here in this paper, this is a fantastic paper by uh, Andreas Bausch's group published in Nature Materials on actin. Actin is a microfilament or the thinnest filament system, if you remember from the last lecture. And they are instrumental in forming the leading edge of the cell of the lamellipodia, as I stressed many times the last, uh, in the last lecture. So it is of course interesting to find out uh, what is the behavior of actin bundling, actin, actin bundling or actin cross-linking over time, because there are many biological applications where you will see that the, in, in many different cells, upon treatment, uh, various types of treatment, that the actin filament is reorganized. Reorganization means reorganization of the bundling. Reorganization means reorganization of the cross-linking. And fascin is one such protein. There are many, many proteins, by the way, actin in fascin. Many proteins are there, which actually cross-link actin to form these uh, giant structures. And <clears throat> So fascin is one example here where uh, you mix the fascin, the R uh, uh, represents the, 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 the ratio of the uh, fascin to actin and this is the concentration of actin of 9.5 micromolar what they used here. So you know the in vitro actin polymerizes. So all these measurements are in vitro protein that is not inside the cell. Till now I am not explaining any experiments which are inside the cell. This is the first experiment we are considering of the biopolymer, which is that in this case, purified and polymerized outside the cell in vitro. Okay. And to that, we add the fascin in a particular ratio and we age it. So if we let the sample stand for a long time, we, uh, uh, for, for some period of time, we call this process of aging. So. We age it from, we, we saw the aging in the paper from zero hours to nine hours. And you will see that as the proteins age, the blue ones are the, <coughs> the blue ones are the, at the, the zero hour, that is you mix the two proteins, you apply a shearing stress, and then you apply a, 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 an oscillatory stress, and then you, you, you measure parameters of the G, uh, the G prime and the G double prime. And you plot it versus the frequency. That's uh, that, that is the this frequency of the, this this oscillatory uh, stress. What what we're applying, and then you see uh, that over time, if you wait over time, the same sample. If you measure after one hour, if you measure after two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, nine hours, you see the G prime decreases. The major thing about the G prime is more the value of the G prime is more solid like is the behavior. Okay. Get it in your head. So this is the this is the you know the, the interpretation of the G prime uh, based on based on the nature of the polymer that if the G prime is more G prime increases it means it it it, it shows more solid like behavior. Whereas if the G prime is less it is more fluid like so we see that with aging, 
it decreases, which means the G prime decreases, so does G double prime. Okay? So it means that the network which was here at the zero hour becomes loosened over time or the cross-linking between fascine and actin is decreasing, making the network with more bigger holes which can flow easily upon shear. Okay, which can flow easily upon shear. But here, when the network was dense, you apply a shearing stress and it does not flow that easily. Okay? It behaves more like a solid. It's a fantastic experiment. So if you have experiments to show or to address the elastic, the viscoelastic changes of a polymer over time, the rheology is the method. And you do it in this way. The methods are pretty much outlined. There are many things to cover, so I will not cover the detailed protocol. But basically, you prepare the protein or you get the protein from wherever, you put it on the plate, and then you shear it, apply an oscillatory shear, and uh, of the, the different frequencies, you can vary the frequency, you can vary the amplitude, so on. You can perform the various experiments, various modes of experiment with the rheometer, and you can get various information out of it. You can also get a creep information that if you apply a constant, you can apply a gradient of uh, the, the sharing stress, you can apply a constant stress, and you can find out the creep compliance, that is the, the constant stress, what is the behavior of the biopolymer. All right, so moving on to the next slide, it actually shows bundling of if actin again pretty much like the same one but in the presence of the methyl cellulose which also uh, leads to more of the bundling of the methyl cellulose uh, of the actin i'm sorry so this is uh, the increasing concentration of the methyl cellulose cmc as you see and the g that's this uh, uh, viscoelastic uh, the, the measurement of, of this uh, polymer, it, it actually, the G0, it increases with concentration of the MCC. The more of the methyl cellulose you, you add, you see gradually the filaments, which was not very prominent at that time, I uh, see the more of the filaments with more of, with, uh, with more of this uh, methyl cellulose, with more of methyl cellulose, you see much more prominent these are by the electron microscopy. So you have to visualize what you are going to measure. So in viscoelastic measurements, there are two components. One is the visualization of the network that you are proposing that this network might be in this form. You need to convince the reviewer that the network is indeed in that form, right? So in order to do that, there are various methods you can use. The, uh, you can use the same, you can use the TEM, it's a scanning electron microscopy. You can use the transmission electron microscopy. You can use confocal microscopy. You can use super resolution imaging, all these modes. And uh, <clears throat> you can use AFM. And all you need to show is what you are telling, that this network is much more dense or this network is uh, less dense. So you need to prove your point first. And then, based on that point, you show the measurements and then you correlate it. Okay? So these are the standard measurements. You see the standard things in any paper on viscoelastic measurements by rheology. So this is one of our papers. So if you have a question like the question we had, so I, so my lab works on the lamin, the nuclear lamin, which is an intermediate filament protein. We look at all the aspects of the, uh, the viscoelastic uh, behavior. We look at the cell biology, we look at uh, the biochemistry of lamin from, from different perspectives. We study the disease perspective of the laminopathies. You might remember I mentioned the last time when I showed you a network of the, of the lamin that you can imagine that this maintains the integrity of the nucleus. So if there is a break, if there is a deformation, a malformation of the lamin network, which is the lamina, then of course it leads to the uh, altered gene expression because the chromosome uh, territories are altered. So we study uh, these uh, diseases with respect to the lamin mutations. And one of our very early studies, <clears throat> when I just started my laboratory here, is uh, uh, actually focused on 
the mutations which uh, lead to the diseases of the dilated cardiomyopathy, where you know that the, that the left ventricle becomes normally elongated at the beginning, and uh, uh, it, it, it leads to the cardiac arrhythmia, and uh, ultimately there is an enlargement of, of the ventricle. And if undiagnosed, it leads to uh, the sudden death. It has a high prevalence in India. Uh, it's it's still very properly. Uh, it's not very properly diagnosed, but there are many many studies uh, which are coming up <clears throat> with time, which has shown the numerous correlation with the lamin mutations and the dilated cardiomyopathy. So we started when we started. What we found, we made a network of the lamin in the test tube. Uh, in we actually prepare the protein expressed in bacteria. These proteins can be all expressed in bacteria in a heterologous expression. We purify the proteins and we uh, polymerize the proteins in the form uh, of the network. It is usually present in the in the in the cell. Well, of course, in the cell it's much more complicated because there are many many different proteins which are helping in the formation of the network. But we we. Uh, made sure that when we made the protein, uh, you can see these are the, the protein bands which are very nicely expressed. They are made in urea because intermediate filaments are usually made in urea, where it's the denatured form, and then we denature it. Proper denaturation is guaranteed by the CD uh, spectroscopy, and then we measure the mesh size of the network. I showed you the last time from the confocal imaging. And then we also did the scanning electron microscopy on the networks and and the first instance was just like voila it's great like you know we can really really see a difference in the network of the uh, the mutant e161k and r190w compared to the wild type and of course you can see that there is more of a bundling uh, in this fiber as compared to the as compared to the wild type now we decided okay does that mean that it has something to do with its biological property also? We, so let us let us resolve the uh, the rheological measurements, and then we can correlate with the with the biology of the cell, with the with biology of the nucleus to be precise. That what happens to the nucleus? It becomes softer. It becomes harder. What happens? So then, what what what, what we did is we made. The protein and we we did the viscoelastic elastic measurements on the on the, the rheometer and uh, we we first standardized the system lamin a uh, so this paper is the first paper in the field which established the viscoelastic behavior of lamin a okay this paper is cited many many times whenever anybody is doing anything on the viscoelasticity of lamin a because this gives you a quantitative measure of the viscoelasticity of lamin A. And it shows a concentration dependent uh, dependence increase of the G prime, which, which actually is the, uh, the power law. And then in this one, if you see uh, the graph uh, in E, figure E, this is from our, our manuscript, that when we have the, uh, when we have the wild type lamin A, which is given by the, the black one, followed by the two mutants, the G prime decreases, so does the G double prime, which is indicative of the fact that the network which we are analyzing outside the cell on the plate of the rheometer, outside the cell on the plate of the rheometer, remember this thing, shows a shear thinning behavior, which means that the network is becoming more and more loose it is not that you know not that tightly linked as it was in the case of the wild type now if you translate this effect in the cell we reasoned that in the case of the mutation which leads to the dilated cardiomyopathy the nucleus becomes softer because the scaffold of the nucleus the scaffold of the nuclear membrane which is this lamin network or the lamina becomes softer. The network becomes weaker. So the nucleus becomes weaker. And exactly we find the similar phenotype from the patients, uh, mainly the studies from the cadavers who died.
died of these complications of the DCM, that the nucleus is severely elongated, which means if you imagine how the how the how the heart functions, so the the heart muscles, which are actually the cardiomyocytes, they are constantly expanding and contracting with systolic and diastolic cycles. So following each systole, it should expand, diastole, it should come back to the normal shape. Now, when it does not, and it maintains that, when it has a memory that, you know, it, it maintains that elongated shape, it does not come back, then fit it into the definition of the viscoelasticity, that it, you know, it, 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 when the deforming force is removed, it still doesn't come back to the original form, right? So, which means this effect is more and more, it behaves more like a fluid. So, the nucleus, which is usually a very stable, hard organelle of the cell, no longer remains that much resilient. And in extreme cases, the nucleus also breaks, also snaps, which means that if the lamin mutations are there, these mutations lead to a change in the organization of the network, which we now have verified through viscoelastic measurements. We now move to a different technique <clears throat> where we would measure the viscoelasticity of the cytoskeletal system. It can be keratin, it can be actin, it can be uh, intermediate, any intermediate filament like lamin. Firstly, we will see the principle. Just going back to the previous slide, the one which I explained to you is an ensemble behavior because there are uh, the, the filaments actually form a network, okay? And that network too is outside the cell. But it is much more, it, 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 it makes much more sense if we analyze the network in the cell. Well, the rheological measurements are also, are also equally important. I'm not saying that. They are, they are also equally important. But measuring in context of the cell, the cytoskeletal softness or hardness or the nucleoskeletal softness or hardness in the context of the cell itself is also very important. So here, it was devised by Dennis Weir's group at UPenn, and this is called ballistic microbiology. So if, if, you, if you see this little device here, uh, helium gas is, is forced through this, uh, this thing at a very, very high pressure. And this high pressure actually uh, is transmitted to this little, um, little diaphragm here. And this uh, diaphragm has in front of it, a little um, filter-like substance on which the, 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 the particles, they are attached, that is the beads, which are the uh, fluorescent microsphere beads, which are attached, which we intend to shoot inside the cell. So by this high pressure, these cells take up these beads inside the cytoplasm. And these beads are shown here like this, okay? And what we are going to do subsequently is follow the motion of these beads, okay? The Brownian motion of these beads, okay? So there will be something called the mean square displacement. And there are a bunch of manipulations from the, form, from the mean square displacement formula by which we can also appear by which we can, we can also arrive at the G prime and the G double prime, that is the uh, the the the, uh, the gain moduli and the loss moduli of the network. So let us see in the next slide the what is what is the mathematics of this. So it's it's pretty simple. So we take the microsphere. Which is usually coated with uh, which which is usually coated with a fluorophore, so that if you excite it with a fluorescence light, you can, you can follow the bead uh, and the mean square displacement is actually so this represents this uh, mean, and this is the this is the, the square displacement. So, and uh, the tau is, is the time lag, 
So you 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 see at any any time t x defines the the position in the x y plane. So there will be x component and the y component. So the the position at t and the position at a time t plus tau. Okay, and that is as you are measuring a single plane, a confocal plane. Uh, so we are referring to x and y, and that you we actually measure for n, n particles, and you summation you do a summation, and this is this. Uh, I mean square distance. And then we do a little manipulation here. What we do, we have this term as a function of frequency here, okay, which we can manipulate by uh, the, uh, the Laplace transform. And this is the Kb or the Boltzmann constant, which is at, at the T at the particular temperature. A is the radius of the sphere. So if, if you know these terms, and if you measure this term and do a Laplace transform, then you can bring it from the time domain to the frequency domain, and then from the frequency domain, we have this the GS by, uh, by, by um, the generalized Stokes-Einstein's equation, and then the, the G prime omega. You remember this omega thing, which I mentioned at the beginning, and the G double prime omega, which are the storage and the loss moduli, can be hence calculated as a cosine and, and the, the sine components of g uh, as a function of time. So we measure something as a function of time, we convert it to the frequency domain, the Fourier or Laplace transform, we use here a unilateral Laplace transform, then followed by uh, this stokes einstein equation, and we can arrive at the g. So this is the mathematical part of it, and based on these, the uh, I'm showing you um, a result from a paper published by uh, Karen Beats Group uh, at Northwestern. So what they did, they're, they're interested in the, the keratin intermediate filament. So it's a KIF, keratin intermediate filament. And these are the different areas, one, two, and three, represent the different areas of this filament network of variable density. Okay. And these arrows show the position of one such bead in that one. So you see the bead right here is this the tiny guy which is shown by this arrow and this little bead here. And if you strain your eyes, you can surely see it. And you will see that the, the mean square displacement is, 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 is given here as a, in the A, that's the, you know, the, the trajectories of the, of, the, of, the, of the movement of the bead. Which you can we can follow by the uh, live cell imaging, and you see here that this bead is entrapped in a thick meshwork, which means it has much less degree of freedom to move, okay? as opposed to this bead, which is moving very fast compared to this bead because it is located at the periphery. Okay? There is there is nothing to to hinder its movement. And now, if you can uh, just follow the, if you can just follow the, the, the color coding, so you, you can find out uh, indirectly from these measurements what is the stiffness of the network. So the stiffness of the network restricts the movement of the bead here. The stiffness of the network at the periphery is less. That's why the bead movement is much more fast. So you see, the interpretations are pretty simple. If you think in your mind, you can actually design grand experiments. You can get grand results from the microbiology. So micro comes uh, refers to the micro beads or the, the beads of that dimension, and rheology is of course a flow. So you are basically following the flow behavior of the network of the uh, of of the cell which you are interested in. And then if you see this little uh, uh, this uh, the bar graph here. You see zone one, that is this one here, the stiffest network because the trajectory of the particle here is very limited, right? Which means the network was preventing the free diffusion of the bead inside this network as opposed to this one. All right? Does it make sense? Okay. So then we have similar type of measurements. It's another paper from Hale and Weird. So you can, you can also go through this paper. You can calculate the mean square displacement from the trajectories. You can calculate the mean square displacement. And likewise, 
the system automatically calculates. You can write a little routine in the MATLAB, which you typically do, which you always do. There are also customized routines in MATLAB, uh, which enables you to calculate G prime, G double prime, uh, which, which, which enables you to calculate the mean square displacement from these trajectories. And uh, hence, you can have another handle of measurement from the uh, <clears throat> Uh, this the microbiology. Now, here is one experiment. The question they asked is, uh, you have an actomycin network, which is the contractile element of the cell, right? So, in, let's say in the muscle cell, you have this actomycin complex, and this actomycin complex is <clears throat> is forming. You know, you, you are familiar with some of those structures which are present in 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 the muscle cell in the myocyte and you know the presence of actin and the myosin present there and how the myosin heads move on the actin and so on so on. so now if the question here is we want to know that who actually controls the uh the 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 uh um, the, the network stability and we is it the actin or the myosin so then for that what they did is they actually uh by this the ballistic the microbiology, they found out these MSDs of the uh, the, uh, the control cell where they did not add any drug. They added a cell, they added a drug ML cell which actually inhibits a kinase which phosphorylates the myosin, and uh, uh, then the myosin actually it, it, it cannot associate with this actin. Blevistatin is actually uh, also another drug which actually inhibits the myosin actin, uh, which, which actually inhibits the association of myosin with actin. And then they also add latrin -kilin. So latrin -kilin actually is a drug which depolymerizes actin. So now you can imagine that even if the myosin is not binding to the actin by the administration of this drug, the actin still maintains this, that robust network and that is enough for creating the uh, stable uh, network inside which the bead moves around. Okay. But if you see the administration of latrin tulane and if you see the control that the MSD increases, that is, when the actin is partially depolymerized by the application of latrin tulane at a particular concentration, the, the network opens up. Okay. And then the Bead can move about much more freely, giving you uh, in also, so, uh, higher MSD as compared to this. Okay. So these are the these are the studies which were which were uh, which, have, which have been performed and which are constantly going on, which gives you an idea about how the nature of a cytoskeletal network is. The one in question, whether it's keratin intermediate filament or it is actin or it is pimentin or it is uh, the lamine, but the question remains the same. What happens to the network under uh, the condition of a disease or a mutation, whatever. So now we switch gears. So long we have been in the ensemble uh, measurement domain. That is whatever we were measuring in vitro by rheology, inside the cell by ballistic microbiology or microbiology whatever you say ballistic microbiology means you can inject it by this ballistic mechanism you can also inject inside the cell these fluorescent microspheres by micro injection all those techniques are there there is uh, you know this is beyond the scope of this lecture to go into the details of this thing but just to give you a flavor of how you measure the things getting inside the cell is no big problem right so what you have to think now is in your head and you will see that some company has already come up with a device to make your dream come true. All right. So, so long in this rheology, microbiology, we were in the domain of ensemble elements. That is, we are seeing the behavior of the filament as a whole. That's an ensemble. Now, if you want to find out that what leads to this ensemble behavior, that is the single molecule behavior. So how each filament interact, how how each filament behaves, okay. Uh, so this is the uh, is the motivation of going into 
the single molecule force spectroscopy where uh, we had a problem like this that we know that this is the architecture of the nucleus this is just you know a subset of the big cell this is the inner nuclear membrane this is the outer nuclear membrane this is the lamina formed of the lamin a meshwork also lamin b is there and these are the connections from the cytoskeleton via actin microtubule mesprin whatever connected to the sun and the sun connects to this one and ultimately the force is transmitted from cytoskeleton to the inner uh, side of the nucleus via this filament the spring like structures and then this lamin is extended or the each lamin filament must be extended in that case right so we are going to study or we try to address that what is the nature of unfolding if we unfold if we take a filament if we take a spring if we if we pull from the ends we are actually unfolding the filament, right? so we want to find out how the lamin unfolds okay so we started with the full length uh, the lamin a and we uh, the aim was to find out the uh, the change in the contour length and the persistence length i'll come to that in a minute what these terms mean but uh, by afm atomic force microscopy this is also called single molecule force spectroscopy and uh, this this uh, is such a big protein it's composed of a rod domain these alpha and coiled coils and the tail domain so you know we couldn't get a good signal from it and what we got is actually a lump of proteins where from that each single protein could not be pulled out so this method relies on the fact that you have to come with the cantilever of the afm tip the protein is here on the on the hold uh, power slip where the protein is, uh, is is there and then you touch it and you pull it so you have to have the statistical units of pulling each single string each single spring but we could not achieve that so the idea was to divide and, and rule which always works as uh, has been shown by our past rulers that you know if if, if we divide and rule it's always to uh, it's always easy to uh, to rule a, a small subject and uh, this this uh, this ig fold domain or the rod domain are the small subjects so when we talk of the persistence length or the uh, uh, the the contour length we are referring to a spring like structure so remember what i told that this is going to be a single molecule method so single molecule method means you should be able to visualize each protein molecule as a spring visualize how you cannot see it right you are going to pull it with the spring and you are going to which is the cantilever uh, tip of the afm and you are going to accumulate such events and do a statistics now if we have a spring we have a spring like this okay and if you fully extend the spring if you if you just extend the spring then you get the contour length of the spring okay now further extend it spring becomes straightened so that's the change in the contour so you have this now now you translate it in in the domain of the protein and you will see that it's, it's composed of amino acids which are of course connected covalently and now if you pull by both the ends one end is is there attached on the on, on the cover slip the gold coated cover slip so that is there so you will immediately ask that it gets also detached yeah sure it gets detached but the force should not be so high that it should get detached from you so the loose end they are dangling here so the protein is here the, the, the loose ends are dangling here so the, the tip comes it pulls up the loose end so then you find out the change in the contour length. Then we have something called the persistence length. You see, if you have this, this filament and if you bend it at places, how easily you can bend it. Okay. So if you see that it's connected by these little dots, which are representing the, the, the filament being bent, 
how easily you can bend it. You remember intermediate filaments, they have lowest persistence length, which means that the different that the distance between any two points on the line that is the that 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 gives you the value of the persistence length, which can be bent. Okay, so there is a component of theta, and we uh, we measure the cos theta and cos of theta at the terms like this. So let's not go into the mathematics part. Physical interpretation is how easy the molecule can be bent. So one is the stretchability, that is the contour length, one is the bendability, okay, the persistence. And this pretty much defines your elastic behavior of the protein group. Remember, I am using the term knowingly that it's an elastic behavior. It is not a mistake. Why? When you measure this protein here, you are assume, you assume that the protein is not in the viscous soup of you know many, many different proteins. Of course, it is not because it's a purified protein. And you take a not a very high concentration okay, so that the protein doesn't aggregate. So that so if you so you see you you, you go you go to a crowded fair. And it is very difficult to find if your friend is lost in that fair. But if the fair, if you go to a ground which is not that crowded, and if your friend gets away from you, and then you can easily find your friend after a little venture. This is exactly the same thing. If you have on the cover slip too many proteins, the cantilever the tip cannot find each individual one. So the protein concentration has to be kept such. Such that the buffer which is, which is kept, we can we can neglect the effect of that, and we can tell we can actually eliminate the dashpot component, Newtonian dashpot from your thought, and you can just confine yourself to the Hookean spring. So all this property connected to a Hookean spring, and there are models like the one-like chain model going into much of the mathematics. What we found out is the following. So this is the device. This is this, uh, this is this AFM. Uh, this is the little protein schematically given here. And uh, the laser is actually uh, shining on, on, this, on this cantilever. And the deflection of the cantilever, when the cantilever moves up, moves down uh, by this the piezo, uh, is actually uh, noted here. And then we can get the signal deconvoluted from there. And, and we can get the force extension curves. And uh, uh, and from that we can we can actually tell the persistence length change, the contour length change, and so on and so forth using one like chain model. So the basis of these experiments actually goes back to the pioneering findings of Julio Fernandez lab at, at Columbia University, where they uh, first uh, made the standard for these stretching experiments by using the I27 domain of the giant the protein called the titan cell muscle cell. Uh, and because this has this multiple, this uh, the, the the beta sheets, and uh, which beta actually folded in the form of, of, of a barrel. And if you pull it, they found this very very regular sort of pattern, and uh, you can have very precise force uh, determinations and 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 the, the change in the quantum length from that. So using this using this methodology. Using this methodology, what we did is we designed our protein that is given in this green red thing, and this I27 in the the blue one. Alternately, so we made a construct alternately in alternate orientation. This was cloned. Very difficult cloning. Excessively difficult cloning. Tandem cloning. Uh, and then we put the when the protein is made, we put it on this on this cover slip, on this, this cantilever, and we get this this little sorted things. Okay. And we compared what was the goal here? The goal of the experiment was, was the comparison of a mutant. It's R four fifty three W. It's an arginine which changes to tryptophan, which changes the the salt bridge. Uh, which actually ablocates the, the salt bridge. And as a result of that, the protein kind of opens up, which actually we did the uh, MBC and uh, we, we we found out the, the the structure of this thing from that as compared to the I27 domain. This is our IG fold domain structure of this thing 
unknown. And in this paper, we actually did this MD simulation and we found out that this R453W, see, we are measuring actually picon neutronal forces, right? So it's a very, very, very uh, limited domain where we are finding, where, where these little forces make a lot of difference. And compared to the wild type, you see, we collect a number of events. And then from there, we actually find out the uh, all the different parameters. And we see that the uh, R453W, it actually unfolds at slightly lower force than which is required to unfold the wild type, which means that R453W is partly open, not open, still maintains its structure, it's partly bulged out such that you pull at one end and then it can be easily uh, it, it, it can be easily un unzipped the entire structure can be unzipped. and subsequently applying this we study the interaction of emerin which you remember is, is a membrane protein in a nuclear membrane protein which associates with the lamin and we found out that the binding with the emerin also is affected due to uh, um, this mutation the stretching is affected due to this mutation and for this stretching we compared the stretching values of I27 as standard. Okay, that's why I explained I27 in details in the previous slide. So now it gives us an idea to formulate what goes wrong if this mutation is there, which produces a disease called Emery Dreyfus muscular dystrophy. Very, it's very common in the Western countries. Uh, this mutation is, is, is a detrimental mutation. So, uh, so emery dreyfus muscular dystrophy, like any muscular dystrophy, leads to severe muscle wasting, uh, you know, difficult contractures, and the Achilles tendons, and so on, so forth. And as a result of this, also we see that the nucleus is elongated, very much elongated. If you see the if you see the biopsy samples of the patients, so we can explain the mechanotransduction in this way that when the force arrives inside the nucleus via emirin that the response to that force is less compared to that of the wild type just to put it in a, in a little bit layman's term so that as a result of this lamin a sort of has lost kind of its elastic behavior and as a result, it is slightly towards the, vis the viscous regime. It cannot respond to that stress effectively as does the wild type. Now, this is in case of a single molecule. So you, you can now extrapolate it in the cell, which is again an ensemble uh, behavior. And that explains what might be happening. And this is, uh, we can explain to, uh, we, we can put forward to explain the pathogenesis of EDMD. So you see, we use mechanobiology effectively to explain the pathophysiology of a disease studying from the uh, from the cell biology point of view from the protein point of view uh, that's the beauty of mechanobiology and uh, there are many examples i cannot go into the details of these you can also find out the uh, the protein folding in presence of the protein disulfate disulfide isomerase, which is an enzyme which helps in forming the SS bond. Another pioneering work by Fernandez Lab, uh, 2012, which was published in Cell. And when a protein is actually folding properly from the two disulfide bonds, kind of stiff, kind of stretching beyond a certain point, and when that disulfide bond is open, there's a change in the contour length, open, you can actually stretch the, uh, the protein freely. So based on that, they had wonderful uh, phenomenological evidence of this, uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, AFM pulling the uh, single molecule protein. Applications of atomic force microscopy on the cells. So, so long we have been doing the cell, and now we, uh, so long we, we have been doing on, on the protein, uh, which is made outside the cell, uh, which is studied outside the cell. Now, if you study the stiffness of the cell, per se, the, uh, the softness of the cell we use atomic force microscopy routinely. And these are the various modes, the contact mode, the non-contact mode, semi-contact mode. There are there are actually thousands of literature on uh, the, 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 the applications of atomic force microscope. So what uh, you can get an idea from here, you can get, you can get actually, uh, you can get a, a contrast.
is, is the level of increase in stiffness, okay? So uh, you can study the stiffness of the cell. You can, you can actually quantify it. So these are some of the, from the prostate cancer. You want to study the stiffness change of the, uh, the cancer cells at the various stages. Atomic force microscopy is a very useful way. You isolate the cells from the patients. You steal the primary cells. <clears throat> you do a collagenous treatment. You remove all the tissues from there. Put the cells on the on the on 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 the uh, uh, surface where you where, where the form layer, and then you uh, examine it by a AFM, and you can get various stiffness parameters from there. You can also get uh, uh, very very useful parameters about the, the the point where the cell ruptures. So you know you can actually tap the cell, and the cell can rupture. So you can, you can actually calculate the force with which the cell prevents the rupture. <clears throat> Some more examples of these, so they, they, they compare uh, various types of the breast cancer cells, the various uh, stiffness of the breast cancer cell, the loading force, and so on. So you can read this paper, it's a fantastic paper by Masaryk Group in Scientific Report, uh, and pretty much gives you a detailed idea. So those uh, who are interested from the biology perspective, from the medicine perspective, this uh, application of mechanobiology is wonderfully visualized by the application of atomic force microscope. Yet another example where you can find out the, uh, the, the, uh, how the stiffness of the cell uh, correlates with the accumulation of actin. And this is, if you draw a line across the cell and you can find out the, where the actin peaks, okay, from the distance from here to here, from here to here. Okay, so how the actin plays a role in maintaining the stiffness of the cell, we can also find out uh, the different things uh, from AFM in conjunction with uh, confocal microscopy. Then we come to optical tweezer. Uh, I think the single molecule, I think, I think you must have an exposure to optical tweezer before, but just to mention, it uses the radiation pressure, which arises from the momentum of light. The radiation force is divided into the two components, scattering and the gradient forces. And uh, these are the balancing of, of the two forces, which uh, leads to, uh, the, you know, the observation of the uh, the movement of the bead uh, modulated by the radiation pressure. Now, this, uh, as you know, the optical tweezer, uh, uh, Arthur Ashkin was awarded the Nobel Prize for this, and this is this has wonderful applications in studying the uh, the mechanisms of the movement of one protein on top of other. A classic a classic example, which has been studied for a long time now, is the movement of the molecular motors on the, on the microtubules. And uh, many other applications. So there, I'll come to a few applications. Now, there can be the two. Uh, uh, there can be the two situations where the diameter of the particle is large compared to breadth of the trapping wavelength. That is a trapping wavelength of the laser, and where the diameter is much less than that of the uh, the wavelength of the laser. So, if it is much less than that of the laser, so it's without going into all the mathematics very uh, in very details. The, the f gradient is actually uh, is is equal to uh, negative alpha by two, where alpha is the polarizability uh, of the tiny particle, uh, which has a dipole moment of uh, mu induced in it due to the laser beam, right? So because this is actually uh, this is actually the photon, which is actually electromagnetic radiation, so it it induces a dipole, and this is the gradient in I, right? So F gradient is directly dependent on this gradient I, that is the intensity of the, of the beam. <clears throat> and also from Newton's law, we know that it's a change of momentum, forces change of momentum. And from here, we arrive at, at this little equation uh, where it is, uh, where this W is the power of the beam, right? So it's, it's actually the intensity of the beam and the power of the beam. So please keep in mind the two things associated with the F scattering, that is the scattering force and the gradient force. And the second condition is, uh, okay, so before going there, let, let, let me point it out that the gradient force is directly proportional to the third power of R, and the scattering force is uh, proportional to the sixth power of R. Okay. And when there is the D is much, much bigger than uh, the uh, lambda, uh, we observe the, the phenomenon of the, the array optics, that's a reflection, fraction, and scattering. Just to mention briefly, if it's a, if it's a, 
microsphere a bit. And if you shine this light here, this is the P in, the momentum in. And then after diffraction, the light comes up through here. This is the P out. So Newton's law, apply Newton's law, equal and opposite force. It's the rate of change of momentum. So there should be force in the opposite directions, right? So there is a force in the opposite direction. And uh, this is actually <clears throat> explained. Uh, this is actually explained in, 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 in this one very nicely that if you have a beam, uh, this is the intense part of the beam. And when you have, if, if, if it moves, if it moves uh, at the bottom from the waist of the beam, it's most intense, then it is pushed up by this, uh, by this radiation pressure and by this, uh, the, the, the moment force and if it is away from that waist of the beam again it is pushed to the center uh, so this is actually what it explains the, the working of this thing i cannot go into the details but the applications of this thing is uh, it is much much uh, it's a, it is a well studied mechanism of studying the red blood cells big and actually they behave as some 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 sort of a some sort of a lens okay and uh, you see that uh, these uh, you can you can actually deform these these RBCs uh, by by this by manipulating the laser beam in, in various manner, and you can get very many information from uh, the uh, the optical tissue measurement. Now, what we did is a uh, step forward. We actually applied uh, this. Uh, so we did an active microbiology. So there are the two terms here, passive microbiology and active microbiology. So passive microbiology means that when you distort with uh, 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 the when you distort with the, with the network and you find out the you find out the motion of the bead as a result of the distortion of the network, right? So it is passively related to the bead. But here we directly embed the bead in the network of the lamin. And also here, the aim is to compare the network of the wild type and the mutant, which causes a severe disease uh, in one of these laminopathies and see what are the differences in the network. So we, 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 we put the bead there, we apply this, this, uh, with this strap, and then actually the, <clears throat> we, we, we monitor the movement of the bead. And from here, this is actually the Logevu equation. So, and from here we can get the, the G prime and the G double prime. It's very complex mathematics. I'm not going into that, but trust me, uh, please read this paper if you're interested. And if you can, fi you can find out the detailed derivation of the G prime and the G double prime, how the instrument gives us this thing. So you see initially that there are, till now we started with the rheology, we, we went to the ballistic microrheology, and we went to the, the single molecule force spectroscopy, and then we went to to uh, the micro uh, active microbiology using optical tweezer. Uh, here, in all these cases, we can actually find out the G prime, G double prime, of course, except single molecule force spectroscopy, where do we find out that the different things anyway. But the, what, I, what I mean to say is that you are at a liberty to apply these techniques based on the suitability of your experiment suitability of the question you are asking and the availability of the instrument at your place okay so these experiments are pretty simple experiment inexpensive things and uh, you just have to know the physics behind it uh, which of course needs uh, a careful reading and design and then you can get many many information which is embedded which is actually uh, which is actually hidden in these networks so what we did actually, we found out first we did a massive cell biology, and we found out that when we transfected the, the C2 C12 cells, that is the mouse fibroblast cells with this uh, wild type and the, the mutant, we found out a difference in the network. You see that there is no rim formation as is observed in the wild type, but it's rather aggregate. And then when we did the confocal microscopy, actually that's the super resolution imaging on the uh, proteins which are made to polymerize on a cover slip, just proteins outside the cell, we see that the proteins also form ligands. Okay, and we actually calculated the mesh size. The mesh size is the, is, is the gaps between the filaments, which are which are actually very very less here. And these 
these networks when we analyze by the optical tweezer that is we we put the other drop of the, uh, the sample on the on the on the cover sleeve and then we actually manipulate the laser by which when we, we manipulate the uh, the, uh, the little uh, the micro, microsphere we see we can extract very nice values of g prime and g double prime surprisingly we saw what exactly we saw from our confocal measurements we saw that the network is stiffer the case of a350p mutant in our previous studies we did quite a lot of studies with the viscoelastic measurements and the cell biology of the of the, the network morphology analysis of the network usually our observation was mutant of lamin a generally leads to a loose network here for the first time we see you remember it's a proline right so alanine to proline so this network is becoming much more stiffer it's becoming much more entanglement right so there is much more entanglement there which leads to the increased value of the g prime and we can see the different deformation forces of the the, the red blood cell you can study the various listing properties of the red blood cell this is another application of the uh, optical tweezer where optical tweezer is used for micro dissection so actually you can hold a cell by a laser particular point and then you can insert a, you can insert a micropipette or a pipette to extract a particular organelle nucleus mitochondria Golgi, you can you, you, you can suck it out from here so you see the mitochondria comes here so this is a fantastic experiment and you can find it in micro machines in uh, public in 2018 from Moose lab all right so now we have come to the uh, more or less end of this thing and uh, in the next five ten minutes i would discuss about the stretching of the cells so now any manipulation of the uh, mechanical transduction or any manipulation of the force would be mediated to the cell from the outside by stretching the cell. So this is a typical cell stretcher. You put your cells in the PDMS uh, in the PDMS um, containers like this, and there are these little holes where you might actually stick it inside this these little um, you see these little uh, tips inside this uh, the scanner here. And then uh, when you turn it on, there is there is actually a microprocessor controller. These two beams on which the cells, uh, the the the, uh, the container where the, the cells are there is placed is stretched. So what you have is while stretching, this will constantly happen like this. If it's if it, uh, it, it stretches in one direction, it's it's an uniaxial stretching. With uh, stretches in both x and y, it is actually by axial stretching. Right? So this stretching can be cyclic. So you keep on doing it at a particular frequency, uh, like as 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 many uh, as many times you like, or as long as you want, depending on the need of your experiment. And this is the basic uh, design. I don't have time to 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 go in there. You can read this from uh, this Alford's paper. And uh, one of the typical applications is you see these cardiac myocytes, which are known and which are stretched. And you see that there is a difference in the organization of the cadherins, which are present at the periphery of the plasma membrane and the extracellular matrix, right? So stress, constant stress leads to the alteration of these molecules, which are present at the interface of the stress. And also, there are uh, examples where if you uh, stretch a cell uh, uh, and if you inject, uh, if, if, if you inject this, uh, or, or, or if you put actually, not inject, if you put a, a, you know, a GFP NLS, that is NLS means a nuclear localization signal, and the GFP means it's a handle, the fluorescent protein, you could go to the nucleus. If you see that, uh, if, you, if, you, if you stretch the cells, the nucleus has more ability to take up the things, which in this case will be the GFP NLS. Uh, so uh, uh, many hypotheses have been put forward. So there are the nuclear uh, nuclear envelope contains nuclear pore complexes. So when you basically pull the cell, you are actually pulling the nucleus also. 
And when you put in the nucleus, the membrane on the nucleus gets stretched. And as a result, the nuclear pore complexes, which are nothing but little holes, which actually allows the nucleocytoplasmic transport, they also get kind of stretched, making room for more entry, right? So you see some, some simple experiments, some simple conclusions, but majorly important can be derived from these uh, mechanobiology experiments. So I've come to the end of my, of my, of my talk. And uh, if there are any questions, you can, you can, you can ask. Okay, so uh, Dr. Srivastava asks how the cantilever teeth is made to attach to the proteins. Fantastic question. So actually, this this cantilever is controlled by a by a motor, and these proteins are actually so. If you imagine, if you imagine the uh, uh, this uh, the power slip to be like this, cantilever is coming. It's actually touching the uh, the, uh, the the power slip on which the proteins are immobilized, and then it's pulling. Right, so it's coming, it's touching. So before that, we have to calibrate the movement of the teeth up to this this uh, uh, the gold coated cover slip. And the moment it touches it and it pulls it, how do we know that it pulls it? Because we will see a signature profile that it has pulled a protein. It has pulled maybe a single a molecule of. Protein. Okay, does it answer your question? Uh, any special ligand? I don't know what you mean by the ligand. Uh, what, what do you mean by the ligand? No, I mean that tip is, a, is actually a silicon nitride tip. So uh, before uh, we use the silicon nitride tip, so all these, you know, the spring constant of the tip, that is how fast the tip vibrates and all these things. It, it, they are all, all calibrated and all experiments are done in a buffer, just a buffer, right? In water where there are the no proteins, right? So it will just come freely and do like this. And then this tip actually connects to the protein. When it connects it, the, the, so there is some sort of force working between between this tip and uh, this a protein, and the protein gets attached to it physically, pulls it. When you you, you talk of a ligand, you can also use the ligand for for a different purpose. Okay, so what you can do, you can use a ligand. Let's say you have a an antigen on the cell surface. If you are measuring the cell and you have the antibody of that antigen immobilized on the cantilever tip, okay? then you, you come with this thing, antigen antibody reaction brings it together, and then you apply a force to overcome that force. So then you get a, uh, a peak. Okay? So then when, the, when it moves further away, the force declines, there is a force. Thank you.